you talk in the book that you say that your favorite, and you've had so many great jobs. I mean, you, uh, in your life, you achieved all these great dreams. You said your favorite job ever was being governor of California. Yeah. All time favorite job. It was the toughest job, toughest job, the toughest job without any doubt, because to bring 120 legislators together and make them agree on anything, it's kind of like impossible. Uh, but we made it possible. We figured it out. And um, I think that to serve 40 million people and to be the governor of the greatest state in the union greatest state in the country. Out of 50 states, California is by far the greatest state with the most revenues and the most power, the most diversity in the world. It's uh, unbelievable. And not only that, but we are actually now the fourth largest economy mm -hmm. in the world. So to be governor of that, it's just unbelievable, the responsibility. And uh, you learn a lot. I mean, it was the most extraordinary learning experience to sit in that capital and to have meetings. Think about that. Uh, if a meeting from nine to 10 with the nurses union and they want to have a better ratio between you know, patients and nurses, if you know, for, for every uh, four patients, one nurse rather than for every six patients, one nurse. Mm -hmm. And I never even heard of that before the ratio. So you learn about all of that and what is it that nurses go through and why is it important? Because when they lift a patient from the operating table, you know, under their bed, uh, uh, there's two women cannot sometimes do it if it's a heavier patient. So they need a male patient there. So they were fighting also to have male patients that they're a little stronger to, to lift the male patient. nurses. So yeah, all yeah, of yeah. this, so all of this stuff, I've never even heard of those yeah. debates. Then, then the, the prison guards come in and say, we are working so many overtime, so much overtime that we need to have more prison guards. We need to hire more and we have to have more salaries and more wages and more benefits and all that. So they talk about that issue. Then the, the, the teachers come in, the teachers union, they talk about the, you know, teaching and the challenges teachers go through. Then the people that represent the kids coming. So this is how it goes on and on and on from morning to night. And it's always issues that you have not really been aware of. So in the beginning, it was kind of like a university where you study new subjects and new issues all the time and you become so smart with all of this stuff. Yeah. And I had one advantage and that was I was not a real ideologue. You know, yes, I was conservative. Yes, I'm a Republican but I'm not stuck in this ideological corner. And I didn't look at the Democrats as the enemy. I always felt kind of like in order to make this work, you have to have Democrats and Republicans work together. Yeah. So we work together and we figured out what is it that we can do together and then let's fight over the other issues. People are so but hungry we, for that. Yeah, right and, so, and so There's, that is yeah. really what we did. And that's why we were able to do, build all this infrastructure and why we were able to do the, the redistricting reform and get rid of gerrymandering and why we were able to go and pick so many minority judges and women and, and all of this. So we were able to do things in the environmental issues that we tackled. I mean, it's the only state that really reduced its greenhouse gases, its pollution by 25% within 10 years. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of great stuff that was going on. But together, Democrats and Republicans together did this work. Not Here, me, not the Republicans, but Democrats and Republicans. Here's what uh, really I took away from your book and, uh, and what you're saying right now is early in your career, it's you. And you ha are in a situation where you can control your body. You can control what you do to your body and how you build your body. You can be in full control as a bodybuilder. Then control was very important to you when you got into movies. How can I prepare myself? What roles are right for me? What roles are wrong for me? If I'm going to do a comedy, what should that comedy be? And what would the best way for me to, how could I best show my humor? What would work? Who's the best this? Who's the best that? When you become governor, you put yourself in a situation where a governor can do so much. It's almost like you willfully put yourself in a situation where you don't have a lot of control. There's a lot you can't control when a job is that big. Do you think there was some part of you that was pushing you into a situation where you can't control everything. All you can do is try, but you, there's a lot you can't control. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, but you don't want to. Yeah. 
you know, because you don't want a dictatorship. You don't want to have one person make all of the decisions because we're not right. perfect. Right. You know, and sometimes that goes overboard mm -hmm. and you start going power crazy and stuff like that. So you need always to have a check and balance. I think that's really terrific. But what you can do and where you have total control over is motivating people to move forward and to do great things. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter what your philosophy is, but to say, we must sit down, guys. And we got, got, got to build more highways and freeways, more tunnels and bridges, more on-ramps and off-ramps, more school buildings, more university buildings, affordable housing. Let's do it. We can do it. You know. So now they go and they go, you know, oh, this is great. And they sit down and you can motivate. So you become kind of the motivator and the force behind bringing people together and creating a vision. Like I said in the book, you know, visualizing is the most important thing. I had very clear visions, of course, crazy visions of what California can be. I visualized, I told them, I visualize, you know, every city having a thousand cranes. And we are building and building and building new dams, new highways, new this, new that. New this. And it was a crazy vision, but you have to have a vision. But it motivated them to sit down and that we were able to do $60 billion of infrastructure, half of what I wanted, but we did it. Mm -hmm. And so this is really the great thing. So I think that one thing we have control over is motivating. And that's one of the things I feel like is missing today. There is no one in Washington that is really rallying up the troops and is motivating them and becoming kind of like their, their, their motivational kind of force behind it to bring people together because there's a way of doing it. Mm -hmm. There's a way of doing this. People, the people are not saying, I don't want to get together with the other side. I think you just need someone that motivates them and uh, really make it attractive and kind of like talk to them and communicate the right way. And so this is, I think there's certain powers that we do have that was that I was able to use. And I was always a positive person, you know me. I mean, it was never kind of like, I always see the world kind of like uh, Norman Rockwell. You know, Norman Rockwell, he always painted everything that was fun. Kind of optimistic right? exactly, and fun. Exactly, optimistic yeah. and fun and colorful and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I, that's the lens that I look through when I look at America or when I look at any of the issues or the problems, I think it's always through that lens. I see it bright, I see it, don't see it dark and black and white or anything like this. I always see it bright and there's a bright future ahead. And I think that that to me, is much more helpful than always being depressed and like say, oh my God, things are terrible. Things are going downhill and all that. Yeah, uh, I was I was very impressed too, at, which I didn't realize in the book is you had uh, uh, surgery that was supposed to be routine just a couple of years ago and something went very wrong in the surgery and it was touch and go. Oh yeah, and I mean, I was really pissed off. And you, I can tell you that. <laughs> I, I mean, think someone, about it. You go I'm in pissed there. pissed off that I had a life and death experience. No, but I mean, think about it. I mean, you go in there and you say, they say it's a two hour procedure. Yeah. And the next thing you know is you wake up and they say, okay, this is 16 hours later. Yeah. And you're trying to talk. And you go, oh, 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 oh. They say, well, no, don't, uh, don't try to talk, Arnold. I, I, you still have this thing. They put a tube in your throat. Tube yeah. In your throat. And so they did not put a th the, the tube out of my throat. They, <laughs> you know, I'm coughing. And they say, all right, let us explain to you. <sighs> Things went south. We punctured through the hard wall with the wire. Accidentally. Accidentally. Oh. This was the wire that's supposed to go up and remove your old valve, aortic valve. And then the other wire was supposed to replace that and put a new aortic valve in. But by accident, we punctured, punctured through the wall and it created internal bleeding that we had to do an emergency opening of your rib cage, rip everything open very quickly, otherwise you would have died. And now we had to then do this and do this and that. Then, then we, uh, by accident, also damaged the uh, other valve and this is how it went on. And so now 16 hours later, but we, we saved you. You say, well, that is really fantastic. <laughs> so I had to kind of like what I call their shifting gears. Yeah. You know, yeah. I had to shift gears because now this thing like going after in the afternoon, then out and, and uh, you know, uh, having a good time was out the window. Now I'm trying to survive. And this is to just to reiterate, you thought you were going in for arthroscopic, like, orthoscopic, orthoscopic uh, 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 thing. And then you go home that night. 
I don't and have go, your pizza and, you and pet your donkey, yeah. and then you oh wake up 16 hours later, and they took all of your insides out and put them back in exactly, upside down. That's right. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, so this is what what what, what happened, and so now. You have to shift gears because now you have to say, when they tell you that uh, you're not out of the woods yet, because what happens a lot of times, they say, is you can die because of uh, pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And so this is why it's very important that within a day, you must get out of bed and you got to go and start walking to really get lung exercises because that's what usually trips you up. And so it's very, very important that I, said, I now start setting my mind, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to get out of bed. As soon as they wheel me from this station over to my bedroom, I'm going to get out of the bed, you know, no matter what, and I'm going to start walking. And so this becomes like the mission, you know, to start walking. I don't want to die because of pneumonia. I've gotten through the surgery and blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, it was kind of a touch and go situation the first few days, but then I got stronger and stronger. And three months later, I started with uh, Terminator 6. Yeah. Yeah. I started filming. So three months later, I started filming again. They couldn't believe it on the set. And I was back again working out regularly and all this stuff. So, you know, I think that, again, with the positive way of thinking, and I can do it, and nothing is going to stop me, you know, with that kind of an attitude, I was able to do that. This book is, I recommend it to everyone, Be Useful, Seven Tools for Life. I recommend it because the the... Quality that comes through again and again and again in this book that's really sweet is humility. You have a lot of humility for someone who is almost like the cartoon representation of you can do it all and achieve everything. You're very, very humble and uh, you have a lot of empathy for people who maybe don't have some of your qualities or struggle. You have an incredible amount of empathy. And I could see that when you made these videos after January right, right. 6th and Ukraine, and that really spoke to me. And I thought, right. God, I, I'm happy this this man's out there and he's doing this now with his platform. Well, so, thank you very um, much. Thank you. I, I love being a motivational speaker out there and uh, writing a motivational book and having a motivational newsletter that, that is out there yeah. every day. And uh, to do all of those kind of things, the pump club and all this, you know, I've, I felt kind of like I was motivated my whole life by people and I want to motivate other people now, millions of people around the world. Yeah. That's my mission. I feel motivated. So do yeah. I. I don't, I mean, I don't think you're motivated. Oh, oh, you don't. Um... She's not more motivated, but I think I'm motivated. I'm still stuck in your hate Ashbury days. <laughs> <laughs> she. Well, I, I, I see <laughs> that you're motivated. Yeah. I don't know why Conan is after you. I'm I mean, Thank it's you. like you're the only woman in this room. Thank and you. who is he attacking? Oh, my you. God. It's yes. like unbelievable. Yes. Maybe you're motivated you know, to quit. You know what I'm Thank saying? You. Yes. I'm going to start a rumor that he has a hostile work environment. <laughs> Okay. It's I'll not a rumor. Up, it's not a rumor. I will back that is you all up. I need it's right now. It's not a rumor. It's not a rumor. <laughs> it's not a rumor. It's not a rumor. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger, thank you very much. God bless.